on my property. You didn't win shit in my yard. Wait, wait, I win all of you. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Aarons. And thing. Um, if you walk, there were a couple of really good sized fish. And instead of me thinking going into this, like I said before, for new people listening, I'm going to fish. You know, good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing tonight? Ah, lovely Wednesday evening here in the old summertime of Northern Virginia, Shenandoah, Upper Potomac, Rappahannock River, and heck, let's even throw in the Susquehanna. It is smallmouth season, everybody. It is river and creek fishing galore. And I thought that would be a really cool topic for today, talking all things creek fishing and river fishing. If people have any questions or comments, please leave it in the chat today. Uh, we also might be having a special guest later on tonight at 7 o'clock. I think we're going to be having on the guy who won the tournament I fished this past weekend. Um, we're going to have Mr. Leon, which is going to be really, really cool. He's scheduled to be on here about 7 o'clock-ish. So I'm going to try to get through everything that I want to talk about before we have Mr. Lee Wells on. Um, so yeah, it's going to be kind of a laid back, uh, live stream, super chat type of ke catch up. Mm. Ah, refreshing. So yeah, today, what I really wanted to talk about, uh, before the interview I'm going to have is the tournament I fished yesterday, all things Creek and river fishing and kind of go through what I did in this tournament. And if anybody has questions, kind of let me know. So without a further ado, let's get into it. I got to fish my second ever kayak tournament on my home waters, so to speak, of the Upper Potomac, the Shenandoah River, two places I grew up fishing. I grew up in Loudoun County, Virginia, literally on the other side of the mountain. So I used to float and, and fish my old tracker boat through that area all the time growing up. But I got to do it out of a boat, generally speaking, when, when I was like doing a lot of fishing. And I never tournament fished out of a kayak before on the river. So it really had its own unique set of challenges. And so going into this thing, you know, I did a lot of practicing on the Upper Potomac, really thinking that that's where it was going to be held. And, but to me, it came down to time. It came down to a time consideration and about not wasting and maximizing those eight hours you have on the water. When I fished the Lake Anna tournament of the N NVKBA, I felt like I was wasting a lot of time. It's my first time fishing out of a kayak, not a Ranger with a 250 on the back. And, and I wasn't I probably fished three to four hours out of the whole day. So much of it, I was just paddling and not really thinking about it. And so going into this tournament, I really want to maximize my time. And the spots I had on the upper Potomac were too far apart. I really, I really couldn't fish it efficiently, uh, I believe. And I thought wind may or may not play a factor into it. I had no idea the wind was going to be as bad as it actually was. So I decided to fish the Shenandoah River. Um, and so to kind of, we're going to kind of get into play some images here. Uh, kind of my day, I did have GoPro issues as if you guys follow my Facebook page, you know, I basically land blasted GoPros on Saturday because I had two on the boat and both of them died. One died right away, which was the one that's behind me. That really gives a good overlay. And then the one that was facing me died all the way about halfway through the day. So we'll go over some tournament footage first, talk about the baits I used. Um, and then maybe we'll do it in reverse order. I'll, I'll talk about some of the baits I used and go over the footage and then just talk about how I picked it apart. My thoughts. Um, I did end up with this tournament. I think I finished 18th. I think it was like 18th or 20th out of 50 people that, that, that participated. So wasn't, wasn't fantastic. Uh, I had four and out of the five I could possibly keep, I had 55 inches, I think. Um, but I had a lot of opportunities. I caught a ton of dinks. Um, and as we get into the footage here, I had the opportunities to finish in the top 10 and I just didn't execute on them. So kind of like, let's just, let's just roll right into it, guys. Uh, let's get this up here on the old screen. So, and then this is, this is kind of what I've been able to salvage. And I did take and cut down all the dink catches and kind of get just the major ones here. Well, this is the first one of the day, which ended up being, I believe if I go back, to the app. I think it was like over 17 inches. So right away though, I do want to talk about the, I mentioned this to some people that I talked to before and after the tournament, my net jobs out of a kayak are absolutely terrible. Um, I don't even know if you guys recognize that. Like this is something just, it's just such a gut, complete gut wrench to me. Um, I did terrible with the net in this whole thing. Um, if you watch, 
I just feel awkward getting it out of the back right now compared to a boat where you have a net guy or it's laid there. I felt awkward getting it out from behind me. And then I hooked this small mouth and we'll talk about where and, and what I was using in a minute, but I hooked this small mouth and I, I feel like I have control of it to an extent. I actually don't have any control of it at this angle. And you can tell it starts running the other way across the boat. So what a intelligent person would have actually done is tired the fish out first and not been in such a rush to get it into the net. I was too hopped up on Red Bull in five hour in the morning and I was forcing this fish into the net, which was a huge no, no. And that would come bite my ass way later in the day. Um, and the other thing you can tell here, I'm lunging. I have a massive net. I'm lunging this net towards this fish. And I really feel like I, what I should have done is taken my time, kept the net a little bit closer to me and brought the fish to the net. Instead, I'm trying to jab at the net here. And I'm just getting sick to my stomach just reliving this, by the way. <laughs> but I, I barely get this fish actually into the net. I'm so pissed that that back GoPro was dead and you can catch this fight. But that was fish number one, which is about 17 and a half inches. Pretty good start. So with that said, before we get into the rest of the film, kind of break down what I was doing. So Shenandoah River, at least the main section I was floating, which I'll, we'll bring maps up and I'll show you that too. Um, it got really dirty and... I was being able to focus on a section that had a little bit deeper water and it went from a riffle to some deep water before it went back up to a riffle again. And it was a decent stretch of deeper water. And, and I liked that because I knew in practice that there were a couple of really good sized fish. And instead of me thinking going into this, like I said before, for new people listening, I'm going to fish, you know, the whole main stem or when I thought before, I'm going to fish the whole upper Potomac, which was really, I was going to, I was going to drop in at Point of Rocks and just float down and have my parents pick me up. I knew there's two nice holes on the Upper Potomac, but I didn't know if I could hit them both efficiently in the same day. And I kept remembering all I needed to do was catch five. So instead of thinking about floating the whole river, my thought was like, I just need to find a hole that has five ones that I think could, could put me in you know, contention. And so this part of the main stem I knew about, it was a little bit smaller section compared to the Upper Potomac. And I felt like I could, I could have them there. But the water was a little bit chalkier. Um, I tried to throw crank, I tried to crank baits, chatter baits, jigs, shaky heads, all, everything. The one thing I could get them to bite consistently, and this is funny because this is what I did a lot in college, were crank baits. Um, this one right here, I don't think striking makes this anymore. Chat, help me out if this is true. This is the striking um, square bill. This is, I think, the 2.0, if I believe, in chartreuse and black. And then I also had tied on a striking. And it, this one is the chartreuse in blue, but I sharpied the, the top of it. And you can see like, yeah, this one right here had some paint worn off because they were hitting it so hard. The chartreuse in black back. Uh, I think this is the series three, I believe. I'll, I'll link it in the episode description, but this is the series three. And this just got a little bit deeper. Um, and the key was that I did with these is I changed the hooks out immediately. Uh, this is something that I try to do religiously. I didn't do this at Lake Anna and that bit me in the ass on, on two that I had on a crankbait. But this is, I go with the, the, the I guess they're, they're called the, the Trocar triple grips. Uh, that's generally what I usually throw on my crankbait hooks just to maximize my ability to get this fish in. Um, and this one here, this first one just swallowed it. It was in its gut. And that's always a really good sign. Um, and and I, I truly am of the belief that you live by the treble hook and you die by the treble hook. You know, the one nice thing about having trebles is, especially with smallmouth, I believe that they will sometimes hit something so hard they just miss it. And that's the one thing I've run into when I throw, you know, chatter baits and, and spinner baits for that matter. Um, when you're dealing with smallmouth is sometimes they'll just hit the crap out of it and never get the hooks in them. And so when you go to a, a jerk bait or a crank bait, the one nice thing about that, the benefit is they don't necessarily have to get it really good and you can still, you know, get them to eat it and get them in the boat. Um, and for some reason, I just could not get them to just to hit and stay onto a chatter bait, which was frustrating. There are a couple more baits I did throw and we'll get there to them. And that was, that was fish number one on the day. Let's get up fish number two. Let's see. I know I don't have all of them on here. What is this one? Is this fish number two? No. Oh, it's Mr. Kitty. Dude, the amount of catfish that I caught throughout the day was insane. I caught a ton of channel cats. And this is one thing I don't know of. I'm not a biologist. I really should have asked Odenkirk, actually, when we had him on. By the way, huge shout out to Mr. Odenkirk. That episode launched yesterday, and that one is doing extremely well for the channel. Thank you so much for coming on. But one question I had for him was like, do catfish and bass school together? If you catch catfish, should you move? I've never known whether that's true or not. 
But if you're interested to find out, let's see, what's going on with this. So and this is all happening just early morning. The, the cloud and the wind cover, as you can see, like it, I don't know if you guys can tell from the water, there's just an absolute insane amount of chop. It was insane out there on the river. Again, yeah, I think this was number two. Again, again, catching a small mouth. This is something I didn't think of. It was catching a small mouth of treble hooks in a kayak. Uh, it, it makes sense until you factor in the kayak. Again, this is where you really, really, I was thinking like, maybe I shouldn't have been throwing these all day because I'm, I'm shocked. I'm absolutely shocked. I didn't get a, a freaking hook in the in the hand or the butt. And that was that was number that was the, the number two good one. I know that I that I actually got in the boat today. I know I have one of the big mistakes. Yep, this is it. Oh, God, this is it. So. I'll walk played all the way through first. So basically what happened there, I know it's really hard to tell because my back camera died. This one right here he ate the thing right in front of me. Now context of the situation uh, i'm targeting specific boulders as they drop into the first deep water and the current is starting to pick up because of the wind it's getting rough as hell out there and it's pumping i mean the water is absolutely going and i throw this crankbait out there and it ricochets and again i cast it straight up current and believe it or not i am in a pedal kayak and i basically was pedaling upstream all day um i deflected it and then I just, I lost the crankbait. I couldn't feel it anymore. And so I kept reeling to try to get, to get ahead of it. And by the time I did, it's like, oh, I have one on there and he's coming downstream. And so I didn't really get a good hook into this fish. I saw him at the front of the boat and he was bigger than the first one I caught. So he was every bit of 18 to 20 inches, every bit of 18 to 20 inches. Um, and I was just fiddling with the net way too much. I, I you know, going back and, and looking at this footage now, I can really see it that I was paying way too much attention to try to get this net standing up, dealing with this fish. Should I come across? Should I go left? And I think what happened is like I kept moving the rod tip back and forth and I kept losing connection with him. And I really felt like that hurt me. And you see, I, I keep going down like, should I get the net? Should I try pulling this fish a little bit harder? Um, granted, I had. 16 pound fluorocarbon. I mean, generally speaking, when I fish crankbaits for smallmouth, um, I like to go a little bit heavier so I have a little bit more power with them because sometimes they'll absolutely just just nail it, they just hit to smoke the crap out of it. Uh, but also if you get snagged, and this is a big thing when it comes down to the tackle that I generally pick, if I can get away with it, of course, is I go a little bit heavier from a kayak. And this is just even why I would float for fun, because if I get snagged up, it's easier for me to get it, get it back compared if I'm using my my four pound, six pound test stuff. Like I'm doing like, you know, like Champlain or, or St. Lawrence river or something like that. Like, you know, it's a lot harder to get that tackle back. Um, and luckily because of this water clarity, it was a little bit more forgiving, at least where I was at, I could use a little bit heavier stuff. Um, but again, you know, it was just bad decisions on my part, really bad decisions on my part. You know, don't worry about the net focus on the fish. Um, and then, I mean, this is like halfway through the day and I finally make the idea like, okay, I was forcing that crankbait bite way too hard. I had most of my success with the crankbait. I got my bigger ones with the crankbait. And I think one of the bigger mistakes I made all day is I stayed too long with the crankbait. I was forcing that bite. Um, I was forcing that bite way too hard. And so what I ended up doing is I went to a swim, a swim bait, and then I would go back to the crankbait one more time and I would lose two, but this by this time the GoPro died. So I lose two and then I just went with a, a bottom bumping bait the rest of the day. But I did pick up a couple on um, a swim bait. So, yeah, I mean, besides that, sorry about that. So the, the other half of the day footage completely died, but I ended up losing two more nice ones on a crankbait. I couldn't get them in the boat. One of them was even worse than the last one I showed you where I, I again, it's so funny. You look back at this footage and you think like it's just for YouTube, but I learned so much from it. The first fish I jabbed the net too hard at. I was I, I, I did this and. It's a no-no. Well, guess what happened early, later in the day? I had another one that was about 17 inch, inches long, and I, I pushed the net towards him. And guess what happened? The crankbait hooks got caught in the damn net. And as soon as that happened, my thought was, I just lift both of them. And so I tried to lift both of them into the boat. And of course, it shook. It hit the gunnel. Boom. Out. Gone. And that was my last big one I had really on a crankbait. And then I kind of went swish and went back full swim j or full swim bait and, and and bottom bumping bait. And that's like that kind of gets into my other baits. So the other ones that I had a lot of success on, I caught a bunch of keepers on this, just nothing really good. Is going with that small swim bait. This is a Kitek. 
uh, with that darker back, that brighter belly. And I put this on the Okashima, you know, spin head. And I went with the one eighth, but I also had a one fourth available to me. Um, and then all you got to do, thread it on there. I always touch everything. I don't care what it is with a little bit of super glue, especially when you're dealing with small mouth and really, really good bluegill, like a good bluegill, bluegill population that you have on the Upper Potomac and the Shenandoah, where they'll just tear at the bait. Um, and this is important for the Ned rig too. But then you kind of get something like that. And I, you can go with it. You can go with a, um, the fat is what I generally like to go with. And you can go with the 2.8, even the three three is fine too. But I, I kind of like the 2.8 the most. You'll get the most bites with that too. Um, I use that a lot. That one was what I paired up with the lightest stuff. I had 15 pound braid to, I think it was like 10 pound fluorocarbon with, with a FG knot in between spinning reel combo. Um, and that one I had a lot of success with. I mean, whether it's, you know, a little stained or bright clear, that small swim bait is, is deadly. The hardest part about that is when they start nipping at the tail, which is just kind of a fact of life with all these baits. The other thing that I had a lot of success with, sorry about that. And this is something that I've been doing for a while. And I think I did a video on it. It's, it's, it did pretty well for the channel when I first started. Uh, it was a power Ned rig, a power Ned head. Um, this is something that I'm a huge fan of, especially now that I'm kayak tournament fishing. And that is this, this bad boy right here. And so all I did is I took a finesse football head. This is a half ounce. It's a, I think it's JDM tackle or balling out makes it too, but it's a half ounce. And they also make it a three fourth ounce. And so what's nice about that is I can pair that with, I can pair that with something like this. And this right here is just a medium heavy. Uh, this is a Phoenix rod with an extra fast tip. And I pair that up with 16 pound test fluorocarbon. And then I can really whack on those small mouth without a problem. And what's more important about having the ability to control them with that tackle is the fact that in that heavier chop and wind, I had to go to something heavier to have bottom contact. At least the part I was fishing, the chop was absolutely insane. I mean, the wind was blowing hard. So I had to do something like that just to keep bottom contact. Um, but the other thing is like you were able to pop it a lot more aggressively. And that's generally what I would do with this thing to really generate the strikes is I would drag it on the bottom a little bit. I don't know, five, six seconds, something like that. Drag, 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 and then really quickly just pop. Let it hit back down, drag, 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 pop. And because I had that heavier tackle, I wasn't really nervous of, of getting it snagged up. I could get it out really easily. And usually, if I didn't get him on the drag, it usually was when I popped it, it just wouldn't come back down. And that's when I had the strike. Uh, you know, my favorite color really this time, really all the time. I don't know why. But June bug, for some reason, on the Shenandoah and Upper Potomac works extremely well. I some, I, I, you know, I always keep like a green pumpkin or pumpkin seed, a natural color in my boat. But really, this this June bug works extremely well. Um, but that's something else. Like always have a Ned rig tied on, especially a power power rig. Any questions in chat? Anything I can help you guys out with too? And also, you know, I know no one really cares because like i did i did not do well in this tournament i had a lot of opportunities i messed that up but we do have lee wells coming on at seven o'clock the main man so he'll be actually fun the guy who won the tournament uh, i believe he was fishing the shenandoah river but you know we're gonna find out too uh is there any questions that i can answer in chat or is there any questions that they're gonna have for for mr lee when he comes on we'll get on to the next phase of here there we go okay whoops there we go. So this is the part of the river I was fishing. Um, you have this bridge right here, but it's just right around this um, this sh this Shenandale uh, Shenandale Springs Wildlife. There are some deep holes right through here, and that's all I was doing. Is basically I was redrifting the same areas. And so what you're trying to look for. So if you, I don't know if you guys can see this too well, but right here. So right here you got a riffle section, and then you have this deep hole. And then you have this this really good riffle section in here. And this is actually one of the main ones right in here. Um, those fish would stack up on really key areas. And at least what I found through practice is the fish early in the morning, they would start stacking up on the bank. They were looking for specific boulders that were closer to the bank. And as the sun got up, as the day got hotter, they would move out towards main river current breaks or, or or a rock or something like that and that honestly is just something you got to find they like different rocks at different times 
Uh, and this is another reason I chose to actually just fish a section versus trying to drift a whole a whole stretch is you could figure out every single key rock in an area because you kept fishing it again and again. And basically all I would do is I would pedal up to the to the riffle or the waterfall and I would just drift back down. I would drift down the whole section. Uh, the water there was about at some parts is probably about five feet, six feet deep. Um, so I would drift it. I would drift up or I'm sorry, drift up. That makes no sense. I would pedal upstream casting towards my key spots and then I would drift back. And as I drifted back, I would hit like more of the main river area. And then I drift and then I would just pedal my way back up and then drift back. And you might be saying why I would do it that way. That way, when I was, when I was hitting the juice, I was casting upstream and bringing it back down towards them. And then when I drifted back to reset, I would try different areas to see if there's any fish there. And if I got bit or if there's something that, that was interesting to me, then I could reset on my next rotation and pedal upstream hitting all the key stuff. And, and to me, that's just very, very important that when you get these areas where there's boulders and you just really can't really see them, honestly, um, well, you, I mean, you couldn't see them during the tournament because like it was just chop. But when you get these massive riffle pieces right here, you know, the fish really can't go past that in that section. They can if they want to, but generally that's going to stop them. And so from that riffle, you're going to have a deep pool somewhere. So with that said, from that deep pools, that riffle is pretty much everything in general, a smallmouth needs to, to live in the summertime. Now they will make mass migrations to get to their wintering holes, but in general, they have deep water cover and they can move up shallow to feed. And there's going to be key little things on each of it. It could be just the bank swings in a little bit more. There's some sand. There's some aquatic vegetation. There's some kind of ambush point up shallow. There's a key ambush point somewhere. And if you find that, that thing is going to restack. And that's kind of what I found. Uh, an area within an area was I found a couple of big rocks that those fish would restack on. There was one a little bit deeper that was more main river. And then there was a couple, I think it was on the inside. I guess this will be, yeah, this will be the outside bend on the outside bend, but it was closer to shore. And those played early in the day. But then as the day drug on, those fish started to move and relocate to that boulder that was more mainstream. It, so I just have to keep hitting it until it reset. And that was the gamble that I did is instead of drifting the whole section and getting new fish, I thought like, okay, I think I found some juice. Let me just keep hitting this juice. And hopefully it will reset on me. It did. I had the bites. I didn't execute 100%. Uh, but really for a big, you know, any kind of river you're dealing with, that's kind of what you need to know about, about river fishing. Uh, oh, the other thing I suggest too, if you're going to, if you're going to have a kayak or a canoe and you want to get out, you're going to want a leash or a rope, but you don't want to tie the rope to yourself. Here's the reason. If you slip or something or the kayak gets carried downstream, you could get, it can get in trouble. You can't get away from the kayak very easily, but you do need a way to keep the kayak on you. And this is what you do. You go to Amazon and you buy one of these. This, and now I just know this because I'm a strength and conditioning coach or strength and conditioning coach by trade. This right here is the Iron Bull Strength Belt. These are belts that are made for people to pull sleds. So what you can do is get a rope and a carabiner and you can take and you can hook the kayak to the belt, get out, fish a little bit, pull the kayak upstream. But here's the key. This belt is Velcro. So if you get in a pinch and you slip, you can pull the Velcro and you will pop out of the belt and the kayak can go free. But it's still strong enough that you can pull the kayak up a riffle if you want to. So instead of having to hold onto a rope and try to fish, you can put this on the belt, hook the kayak to the belt. You have the kayak connected to you. If something bad happens, you can take and pull the belt and boom, the kayak separated from you. That's at least what I've done growing up is, is use a belt like that. You don't have to. I just thought it was kind of a neat thing that maybe somebody could find, you know, it maybe help them out. Um, but yeah, that, no, that, that's kind of what I do with that. Let's get back into it here. One of the other things I want to get into with this. Um, yeah, no. And the biggest thing is to get yourself some wading shoes or some boots. If you're going to actually be going out onto a Creek, onto a stream, something of that ilk, 
So that way you don't slip. Um, I suggest getting some wading boots too. Those are extremely important or get some used hiking boots. That's perfectly fine too. Um, and then it just comes down to like your bait selection. Bait selection is very, very important when you're going into some of these creeks. Uh, but before I talk about that, are there any questions out there? I know everyone's waiting for Lee. Perfect. Boy, we got a very, very, not very chatty crowd today. I'd be very good at answering questions tonight. But let me get to Jared sent me something. All right. Uh, there we go. Thank God. We got somebody. Christopher, I am going to... I'm going to have Jared send you something. Thank you so much for, for answering a question here. Did you try and throw a bottom bouncing mad Tom over the tournament? I did not. And honestly, that was probably a mistake. I had mad Tom's in my bag. I got so dialed into that crankbait bite that it, it just came down to me thinking oh, two things. The crankbait I was using generally was producing a bigger, bigger size fish, a higher quality fish. When I was bottom bumping, I generally would catch like a bunch of dinks and then get a bigger one, a bunch of dinks and then get a bigger one. And so in my brain, which was wrong, clearly it was a wrong decision. I thought, well, if I just stuck with the crankbait through the better part of the bite, I would eventually get a bigger bite. And that was just kind of my logic. I said, like, let's just live and die with that, which is completely wrong. Um, I have used Mad Toms and Helger mites, especially in the summertime to a really good effect. And I probably should have done that uh, in the tournament. Um, Jared on my Facebook feed. There we go. Or Facebook chat. Sorry. He says. Did you, did you, what is your favorite stream bait? My favorite stream bait ever. If I had to pick it, one bait to throw for river smallmouth. And this is going to be a hot topic because everyone would be like, well, Tom, you're going to throw a tube. You're going to throw, if I want to get a kid to actually catch something, it's probably going to be a tiny jerk bait. This is a Euro tackle jerk bait. It is literally made for trout. It comes in some fantastic colors. Uh, this one right here is actually made by, I think it's made by trout magnet and also have a couple more from like lucky craft and no, not lucky craft. Um, yeah, it is lucky craft. Uh, the reason I like these things right here is I throw them on ultralight stuff or medium light rod. And I will outfish a guy with a fluke. Um, one other question that I had when I was at Jake's Bait and Tackle today is like about throwing a fluke in the summertime for this. And I don't mind throwing a fluke. I, I really don't. Especially, you know, you go with these smaller ones like these right here. These are the, the Super Fluke Juniors White Ice. I love throwing this. Um, and I will just, app, I'll nose hook this thing on, and I'll usually, and this is something that I like to do, is I'll throw a, a wacky rig hook and just knows it because it's got a little bit of weed guard so I can skip it under near trees and stuff. But the problem is again, with small mouth, they don't usually come up and just inhale it like a large mouth. They slap, they kill. And if you use something like this with these little bit of treble hooks on there, you're going to have a higher, a higher hookup ratio, hundred percent. So my number one bait just to throw on creeks this time of year, it would probably be a micro jerk bait, something like this. If I wanted to get a kid just to always catch something, uh, my next one would be a Helgramite. Uh, like a Helgramite type of bait. Um, if you guys want a great, great conversation I had with Creek Fishing Adventure uh, about how important the Helgramite is, but I would definitely go with a Helgramite style bait if you're wading a creek. Um, and then the other thing, of course, the Ned Rig is very important as well. And then we go into our top water, which we'll be getting into here just before we have Mr. Leon. On the small crankbaits, do you throw the ones with bucktails with any success? I do, especially when it gets later in the evening, I will. I'll throw the ones with a little bit of, um, uh, I guess, like a fly tie on the back. The white ones are usually the best. With the jerk baits, I really don't use that for these smaller ones because they kind of lose their ability to work properly. Let me find some smaller crankbaits. Hold on. Because, you know, basically my, my studio is also my tackle shop, so I have a, a shit ton of stuff here. Here's another good one. Here's another good one. This is the old Bagley Killer Bee balsa bait. Super, super small. That is an insanely deadly crankbait for smallmouth. 
super small, only dive about four or five feet, will bounce off really easily. I love throwing that for a little, my little smallies, especially up this way near the Konica jig in the upper Potomac. But that's a really, really good one, Chris. Top water wise, dead air, the terrible thing for a podcaster or a radio show. I guess all these are coming out of the box. So if I had to start with some top waters, if I'm going to go big, I'm going to go with the Chrome walking bait. Okay. This is by Strike King. Use whatever brand you want. It doesn't matter, but I really think Chrome is very important. Um, that's going to get you your bigger bite. Then what you can go with is the, I think the 60 F Whopper Plopper. Now you might be saying, I like black. I love black too. This is what I do. I buy the white ones and then I sharpie them. That way I can start with white in a day. And if I don't like it, I can always sharpie it black. I, it's just, just what I do. Cause I'm weird. Uh, Cause I, it's easier to change a white one to black than it is to change a black one to white. So I just buy more white than general and I can always sharpie on black if I want to or use uh, nail polish. But that that super duper small uh, whopper plopper is just killer. You're going to get way more bites with that. And you can also go to a buzz bait too. You know, my only issue with the buzz bait and it's the same thing with like a chatter bait, you know, going with a chatter bait or a spinner bait for small mouth is they're going to hit the absolute crap out of it. Um I do, I know I'm the only one in the country, but I will keep some trailer hooks with me and I'll, I'll throw a trailer every now and then, but I will keep trailer hooks with me when I'm dealing with small mouth, small mouth will smack it so hard that I will pick up a couple extra fish by just keeping a trailer hook on there. Good questions, guys. Daniel just dropping in to say, hi, got to eat and then take care of the baby. I'm going to be doing a float down the South fork this Sunday. I can't wait. Dan, congr huge congrats to the baby girl. Fan congratulations. That's awesome, dude. And hopefully you can get out in the water and just relax a little bit. You earn it. And I guess a uh, happy Father's Day to you, dude. But yeah, tr try uh, try something like that th this weekend when you get out there. It'll really help you. Uh, and then, of course, just a boring old wacky worm will work really well, too, especially if you just float it on a one-aught or two-aught wide gap hook, uh, eight to 10-pound test, fluorocarbon leader, and you can just float it. I mean, this one right here, you know, June bug or green pumpkin, that's a perfect bait for smallmouth this time of year. And it really just depends on what you're going for. And I really mean that. Are you going to try to get bites? Or are you trying to go out there and win a tournament? And I think there are two different things. You know, if you're just trying to get bit and just try to just literally catch 200 fish, you know, that you know, a power Ned rig, something like that kind of, kind of do, does both sort of speak. Um, Oh, another key thing too. always, always, always when you're dealing with a Ned rig for small mouth, especially on the rivers, for some reason, you want to make sure you super glue the head, always super glue the head. When you use these things, I don't care if it's the elastic or not because the bluegill and the red ears will just eat the snot out of that bait and they'll rip it down your hook every time. And on the hook set, a lot of times you're going to just ruin a bait. So I always suggest you take and you super glue it just to make sure it's completely secure to the bait. Good questions, guys. But yeah, top water fishing, like that was the one thing I really wanted to get on was a top water bite. And I never did. And that was also very frustrating. I was so hoping I was going to get on that, but I just couldn't. I just really couldn't. And I don't know why. I mean, it's because I didn't spend enough time on the water. Um, and, but I'm still learning. I am. Like, this is my second only kayak tournament ever. Um, and I had some friends that said, like, well, what do you think of kayak tournament? Because, you know, they're they're my bass guys. And I say it's just, it's neat. It really is. It's really cool. You have different strategies you have to do. You know, you can't say you're hitting every primary point on Lake Anna. You know, you just physically can't do that. And you have to re-strategize. And it's fun. Um, and to be honest, it's cheaper. It's just a little bit cheaper than right now when you have, you know, I have a dually truck and a, you know, a big ass, you know, Ranger boat and it costs a lot to go fish a lake tournament. It just is. And to be able to have something that's a little bit cheaper right now with, with the economy, the way it is to get that itch scratched and to fish waters, you never, never were able to like, we, you know, you don't fish tournaments on the Shenandoah or the upper Potomac. That's pretty cool. Uh, I think our next tournament, uh, coming up in the, uh, 
in the series is actually on a couple of electric motor only lakes. That's going to be really cool. Never fished those before. And so, yeah, it's just, it's really, really exciting. It's definitely different. You know, I don't have electronics, which really sucks. I really like having electronics. I don't have a trolling motor and by God, do I want one? Cause okay. Yeah. So I was literally pedaling upstream all Saturday to say I was tired was an understatement. I cramped in areas. I didn't think you could physically cramp. It was insane. Like it was like my crotch, my hamstring, my groin, my ass, everything was seizing up by midday from pedaling upstream. It was miserable. White caps and everything. And it was like my salvation was like to pedal upstream just enough to where I could slowly drift back just to give my legs a break. Um, and I did not also pack any water because I'm a dumbass. So, but I did pack a five hour. So clearly like that works, right? That, that, that's the healthy thing to do. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, no, no. Uh, Sherwood, I hope it really answered your question there. No, the, the, the flies definitely work as long as the water clarity is there. And that was something else too that was interesting is a lot of people, I could be wrong. It just seemed like we're very worried about the water clarity. And a lot of times you can still catch smallmouth with bad water clarity. You really can. And you get to power fish for them too, which is a lot of fun to be able to tangle with these smallmouth in, in the harder current. The difference is you got to put the bait in front of them. When it's clear, you can draw them out and you can see them. And so you could fish stretch of the, let's say up the Potomac and be like, all right, this is a good area. There's a couple of nice ones here. You might not catch them, but you know, they're there when it's stained like that, when it's really chocolate milk, at least it was not chocolate milk. It was chalky, at least in the stretch I was at. Yeah. You, you, it narrows down their feed area. And so you really have to put it on them. So, but no, I, I think the weights were also pretty good too. And, and huge shout out. I think one individual, if I'm not mistaken, I probably should have the stats up, but I don't finish in the top three. Um, and it was on the upper Potomac, which was awesome because I thought the upper Potomac was going to be blown out. I really did. But it actually wasn't, which was really, really cool. Let's get to the next part here. Do, do, do. Let's see. Let me check Facebook Messenger for any more questions. Good questions, guys. And then, like always, uh, I will be drawing a winner from the questions tonight, and they will be getting a, a discount to Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. But again, it only comes to the best question asked during the live stream. Once the live stream is done, it will not count. Also, we are having a new thing through the month of July. Everyone, we want to try to get every single video we have on the channel up to 25 likes and comment on as many videos as you can, because from now through July, we're going to be doing a lottery, so to speak, where we're going to just be selecting random people from the comment section to win prizes. So the more you comment, the more chances you have to win prizes. Uh, and that's all by the sponsor of Jake's Bait and Tackle. Hopefully people have some good ideas for where to fish this weekend, because I think the river is going to show out. And that was the thing, too. I was really impressed with how well the Shenandoah did. It really, really was interesting. It, it really did well. I didn't think it was going to fish as well as it did. Um, and the Rappahannock, too. Like, i am got to learn how to fish the Rappahannock, because it looked like to me, if I'm not mistaken, most of the people in the top 10, or I'm going to say most people, a healthy majority did fish the wrap. And so I'd like to know what the Rappahannock's all about. I've never fished the Rappahannock before. Um, and that's another place I want to actually shoot a Hidden Gems episode once I get the drone back. Um, at least I want to fish the title for largies, but I do want to fish the 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 upper portion of the wrap for, um, <clears throat> for the smallies just to see what that's kind of like. But no, uh, good questions, everybody. Move that right there. Pop, pop. And then we got, and then guys at seven o'clock to finish up the show, we do have Lee Wells on. Lee Wells is going to be on the show, which will be pretty awesome. He won this uh, past tournament and I could probably be actually intelligent here and actually bring up the stats because that would probably actually help with conversations, wouldn't it? But no, it was a lot of fun. Did you guys actually check out the uh, the new interview that I had this week? Oh boy, tough bite, no doubt, mate. Saturday, Upper Potomac stage, yeah, it was. But the cats were biting. Yeah, Scott, I don't even know if you saw that, but yeah, we we just went through some of that stuff right now on the channel. We could go through it again. I mean, it really came down to just bad bad hookup ratios. But you can already see that there's a good chop, and this is like not even halfway through the day just for the people that just entered the chat. But no, I mean, the wind's already howling with this. But so you can see that I'm casting towards the shore. I'm fishing upstream. 
I'm just way too worried about the net here versus just fighting the fish, which again was just a huge mistake. Again, I reached for it. That was stupid. Shouldn't have done that. But at that moment in time, it was still shit. It's probably like 730 ish. So it was still early in the day at that point when I got my first really good one. And the wind was already howling. It was stupid. It was so bad outside. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, shoot. I had 56 inches. I thought I was in like 20th place. I probably should read this stuff more. So I had 56 inches for four. And I lost two that were 17 plus. Oh, shit. I could actually been. I would have been in the top 10. Damn it. All right. That's good to know. That's going to make. I'm going to start drinking again. That's not good. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, Scott, you said uh, about about kitties. I think this is right here. Is this the kitty? I caught tons of channel cats, by the way. Absolutely tons. But all good questions. I think we're going to be having Lee coming on here shortly. But again, I think that's the biggest thing that I really need to learn is about how to use a net from a kayak. Because when you get, you know, when I fished college and I got to fish, you know, the BFLs and stuff like that, it, it, it really is so much easier to fight a fish from a boat in the sense of when you're dealing with light line or treble hooks, you can move. You're more agile. You can move back and forth. And when you're in a kayak, it feels like you're just stuck. And especially with it ripping, like in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have been, I shouldn't have patterned them on crankbaits. I shouldn't have patterned coked out brown bass on a, on a treble hook bait when it was blowing 25 miles an hour. <laughs> it was just not a good idea for success. But um, it was still fun. I learned a lot. Uh, I really learned, you know, I, I swung for the fence, which is was what you got to do. But if I had some tips, though, if you're going to be throwing treble hook baits, you know, all, I, per, I personally believe if you're going to be throwing crank baits, go with those round bends. Don't go with just the regular round bends. Go with the triple grip, something like that that's cave pointing inward. You're going to miss some of the swipers, but the fish that you hook, you have a higher probability of actually getting in the boat. Go with your brand. It doesn't matter. But for crankbaits, I highly suggest that if you're fishing jerk baits, you know, you know, three hook jerk baits, something like that. The Aaron Martin's finesse is really my favorite. Usually you don't have a, a hookup ratio issue with that. And it's the same thing with lipless. You know, I know you guys, I, if you guys didn't know, I did like a two hour lipless seminar back in February, which is one of the baits that I want all, a lot of my money on. If you go with those right hooks, it really does reduce the amount of fish that throw the bait. Um, you're still going to have it happen. You're going to live and die with the treble hook, but it does decrease it. And you'll be surprised about how many fish you actually catch that just would have nipped at a chatter bait or just would have nipped at a swim jig. With the treble hook, you get them. And, it, and at least you have a higher probability of something good happening. So, yeah, I mean, without further ado, well, let's see. We got Mr. The Man, the Myth, the Legend, the one who did it, who tamed the bronze back in the Shenandoah River. Mr. <laughs> One comments. That's a real good one. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great, sir. All right. All right. No, yeah, the man, the myth, the legend. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, you um, did it. Yeah, I did. And uh oh it, I kind of got a story for you on it, but you know, we can whenever you start, you lead and I'll go and we can talk about it. It was okay. It was quite a day. I'll tell you what, it was it was my best day ever for big fish on the Shenandoah. Okay. Especially the North Fork. Okay. Today we have the winner of the NKV, N, NVKBA. That is a shit ton of letters all together. NVKBA trail stop number three, Mr. Lee Wells with 86 inches. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It so, was quite a day. Dude, it it's and you were just saying that there, like congratulations, it's freaking awesome. And I just I just want to hear the story. And, and and honestly, this is something I like to do with all of our winners, whether it's from a boat or kayak. To me, it's always the mental side of things. And and, and this evening, we kind of went through my mental idea of why I fish where I fish, my thought going into it. What was yours? Were you just set on, hey, I'm just going to fish this area and roll the dice? Did you have a game plan going into it? Like, what weighed on your mind going into this competition? There was a game plan. There was there was a game plan from it. Uh, there's a couple of people I'm going to shout out to if you don't mind here as as we go through. But let me set the stage for it. This is my second year for NVKBA. Uh, I live in Woodstock, so the North Fork is five minutes from Nass. Uh, pretty much my home territory, home field advantage, you can call it. And last year I fished a section of the North Fork from the upper section of the North Fork down, and I won and lost it in the first hour. 
Mm. Now, I was fishing with my fly rod and spinning rods. And I mean, I lost them right at my feet, Ooh. right next to the kayak. You know, the kayak strapped next to me, right at the kayak. I lost them putting in the net. I did. I had the old where you put it on the board and they do the fish flop. Oh, my God. Yeah, that I was have the net. Oh, I learned after that. I asked the guys <laughs> and they're all telling me, you know, hey, put your net underneath your board, you know, rookie mistake. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's preach that's it. What it was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I went and lost it in the first hour. And I think all the people that I know over the last year or so that here have heard me tell that part of the story. Because it was. And then after that, after I left that one section for the next six, seven hours, it was just dink fest for me. Mm -hmm. And I was using the wrong stuff, come to find out, and just, it was there. So this year, I said, I got to find the big ones. I got to find some big ones. So I talked to a few friends, and we talked about different sections of the North Fork. And said, hey, let's start looking in. We started looking and some of them went fishing for me. Others I fished myself. And anybody who's my friend on Facebook probably seen my posts where I was, quote, practicing. Well, I wasn't practicing on my stretch. I was practicing other stretches so I could get a feel for what they were doing, what was going on. And watching the water flow, uh, river app. Uh, I'm sure everybody used a river app. Uh, watching that, watching the flows to see what's going on because those fish are going to move. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was good. So my shout out is going to be to A, Randall Grove for helping me out. Randall's a big fan of Jake's Bait and Tackle, good friend of mine. He helped me out with the planning and the talk and, you know, just kind of getting me in the mental state of it. Uh, and a big shout out to Michelle Franklin, who was my person who shuttled me she dropped me off at the start of it and she picked me up at the end of it so so to set that up we studied the river a little bit uh trying to figure out where they were uh and went on kind of went on from there you know so it was a couple weeks of planning of looking and figuring out what's what's going on with the bike and what's going on with the water uh that was the big thing the water turned out clear. The water turned out low. I was hoping for that dose of water on Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday night that they were calling for, but we never got it. So it got low. Uh, I scraped a little bit. <laughs> mm. but I didn't use my big kayak. I didn't use my old town top water 120. I used my old town Durango, little sit-in, you know, 12, 10, 12 foot sit-in, you know, 45 pound, whatever, you know, I could lift and carry it around. I stripped down to minimum gear. I, I brought three rods, okay, and uh, two, ta two, you know, 3,700 tackle boxes, my net, my board, my life jacket, and an anchor. And for anybody who does that, I recommend that you use a window weight when you're fishing these rivers because it'll catch for you. It'll also drag for you, but it's not going to get stuck like a claw will mm -hmm. uh, or like uh, a, one of the uh, mushroom anchors. Those yeah. things will catch an edge and you catch an edge and you get that anchor. It's going to pull you. You get into a current, it's going to pull you right under. Yeah. And then I'd also suggest guys, something I learned from saltwater is use zip ties to your anchor. That way, if you do get stuck, I, th I think there was some kid who's, who's boat flip, but that way it will break free from it. So you can at least salvage something. Yeah. So that was there. So that's kind of the setup for it, for it all. Uh, you know, understanding what, what it was. I, uh, say, I what were you out. looking for though? Like when you said you were, were you just ledges. searching for bigger bites? Ledges. Ledges. I was looking for ledges, see the ledges, look for the dot, the, the deeper sections of the ledges. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really what I was looking for. Uh, especially with the lower water, you're going to have those ledges. Those bigger fish are going to be into those ledges. They're going to be looking. Uh, looking for uh, on the leaves of the boulders where, you know, you see all the bubbles rolling down through, okay? And you'll see where the, the bubbles kind of don't move. And there's usually a little lighter shade, especially if you have good glasses, a little lighter shade. 
cast to those areas. That's where they'll hide. That's, you know, those fish are, are going to be hanging out in those areas. Now, don't get me wrong. I caught my share of small ones. Mm-hmm. I caught a number of dinks, you know, uh, 10 inches, 12 inches. I was doing the same thing you did. You know, put it on the board. Nope. <laughs> put it on the board. Nope. You know, so that's. And that's the hardest thing, I think, when you fish for small, any smallmouth tournament. I don't care if it's here or Lake Champlain or St. Lawrence. You're going to go through a lot of them. And and the mind game is, do you go that route of, do you, are you going to fish baits in areas where you're going to have to weed through them? Or do you switch to the idea of, I might not get as many bites, but if I get the bites, they're right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I focused on throwing three things. I threw three things and those three things all day. And luckily, one of them worked out the best. I threw top water. I threw jerk bait and a wacky rig. Soft or hard jerk bait? Uh, hard jerk bait. Hard jerk bait. This little baby right here. Oh, wow. Is that is that your tackle? What is that? Yeah, that's your my, t- <laughs> <laughs> it's my pattern. I painted it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's my rainbow trout. That's my little, it's a little, you know, two and a half inch jerk bait. I love that color. Finger. Yeah, I, I paint this myself. A few of my friends have gotten it. And uh, we'll get you one there, Thomas. Dude, that is a sick color. Like that is a really nice color pattern. The other bait, and I didn't use this bait that day but the other bait that i highly recommend whopper plopper by the way there you go perfect right there perfect there we go now that's a 75 i like the 75s okay a little bit better okay a little bigger profile a little bigger profile over here you know than the 90s or the 110s and it's a cadence thing okay you know, a lot of people throw these things out and just buzz them right back. You know, the fish cadence. If you ever used a walk the dog method, try it. Hmm. I never would have thought of doing that on a well, whopper plopper. That's really neat. On smallmouth, try the walk the dog method. You know, plop, 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 stop, pause, plop, 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 pause. It's just like a pause with a jerk bait. You know, you got to find a pattern that they're going to eat. Sometimes they'll eat it slow. With a longer pause, sometimes they'll eat it faster with a longer pause. And how I learned that was through my fly fishing. Okay. If those people that don't know me, I'm a big fly guy. Okay. And I didn't fly fish this one. I fly fished last year. Hmm. What did I say? I lost a lot of fish. Okay. This year, I didn't fly fish with it. I wanted to win this year. That was, mm. or at least put five on the board because. I've never gotten five fish in any tournament since I've been here. Okay? Well, this is a good one to do it for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, never got five fish. You know, I'm scared from you that. now. Every time you put five on the board, man, you're going to be cashing a check. I hope so. I hope so. But yeah, that was, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I know it pattern. Oh, sexy. Okay. And monkey butt were the tickets. I how long? Water bite. How long do you stick with top water before you like? In general, how long do you like to stick with it on the rivers before you bail? Well, when the fish quit biting. No. So, yeah. <laughs> what yeah. I'll do is I'll you know I'll I'll throw it a couple things if if I don't if I don't get a response maybe I'll throw something else I'll get tired you okay. know but I'll throw it for a while. Uh, what I did and three of my fish came on the whopper plopper. Two of them came on a whopper plopper mix. Mm. And I threw the wacky rig right behind it. Smart. Okay. Just okay. like you do with a, a Betty, a, you know, one in the in the in the lily pads. You know, you're working a frog, you see him smash it, he misses, followed up with a, a wacky rig or a jig, you know. Same thing. You miss it toss it right out there usually uh-huh. they'll go after it because they're, they're in the feeding mode you mm-hmm. know uh small mouths i've found are much more aggressive than large mouths and that's the fun part about it. that's why 
taking them on a fly rod is so much fun. So much fun. Uh, what do you use for your fly rod setup? Because now I'm curious. Okay. Well, I I use a seven weight Scott. Seven weight. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, it's almost thirty years old. Uh, it was it was it was a present to me uh, many years ago, and uh, it's from Murray's Fly Shop down there, you know, in Edinburgh. Uh, it's Murray's Bass Rod. It's a smallmouth rod. He, you know, he designed it with Scott in mind. And that's what I use. Uh, I use an Orvis uh, seven weight reel, you know, Madison fly reel. Uh, now I also have an eight weight that I built myself. Uh, it's an XI2. And uh, that I use for larger stuff. Sometimes I'll use it when I'm looking for big large mouths or uh, I go, you know, have the opportunity to go to the outer banks and fish. Oh, cool. Out there. Yeah. I'll, I'll fish for Albies on fly fish for sharks on fly. We're usually, usually using 10 weights there, but the eight weight I like to throw for Spanish and blues. That's, that's a lot of fun. And uh, especially standing there in the surf, you know, you're just, and and the blues are coming in crashing in and they're just so cool on those clousers and i mean it's it's action all day long to your thing but you gotta you know you gotta look for them and then there's times that you're sitting there and you're getting smacked by waves but yeah that that's a lot of fun and you know the eight weight i also use when i go down there and fish the sounds for for drum you know for red drum Okay, so we'll get back to the tournament. But the yeah, great yeah, thing about yeah. sorry, this show... sorry. No, 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 no. You no, get no. me off on a tangent in a heartbeat. I'm Dude, sorry. I, th this show's all about tangents, and you got me on one. What is the coolest thing you've caught on a fly? What what, what sticks out in your mind? Uh, it's you got to have a good story. Oh the, well, I mean, there's lots of them. Uh, the the cool the coolest thing on a fly is shark. Black tip you caught a shark on a fly. Black tip shark. <laughs> yep. Went out. Uh, we go. To, we had. We used to go down to the Outer Banks and fly fish down there. We go out with uh, Outer Banks fly fishing. Uh, Brian Horsley and Sarah Gardner. Uh, great, great folks. Uh, went up with with, the, with Sarah for years. Sarah was a great guide. She's probably one of the top women guides on the East Coast. And uh, go out with them, and they'll you know we'll. We'll chum looking for cobia. We're actually out there trying to catch some cobia. And, you know, they'll, the sharks will come in because you're chumming and we'll tease them with a, with a, uh, we call it a squid, you know, on a, on a piece of monofilm on a spinning rod, just tease them till they come close enough and then toss, toss a big fly, red and orange or orange and yellow fly out there to them. And catch them that's pretty cool but i'll tell you what nothing beats an albi bite hmm. or false albacore i mean it runs you into your backing like you wouldn't believe it's wow. you i mean is that shore or are you out on a boat from, these are from boat these are from a boat okay. from shore the, the coolest thing is, is is getting spanish and blues in the surf oh, i mean wow. they're literally knee high in knee high water just eating everything all the anchovies all the bait fish you know and you toss that clouser out there and they take it and zing and you know, you know that, that's, that, that's fun from the, sh from the shore. I, I still want to hook a redfish on a fly someday. It's a bucket list. Uh, my, mind. my first, my first ever. And my only one that I caught was down in the Southern outer banks. Brad, my son, Bradley and I were fly fishing down there. We, we had gone down to do an Albi trip and we had a free day before and we went down and, walked around and fish we caught pompano and then we came up into the sound area and uh, i caught a puppy drum and I, I thought it was pretty cool and the best part about it was caught on a fly that i tied that's that awesome like so much better you know you know it it, it it does it does when you when you tie your own or you paint your own lures you know uh and you know a couple of years back i got started in I was a big trout guy, you know, and I think it was 2018 or 2019. We had all those rains in the spring and the rivers were washed out, you know, mm -hmm. and I was like, I was so frustrated. That's when I got into kayak fishing. 
because I said I had to find something else. And somebody said, oh, why don't you go up to Lake Laura or go out to uh, Lake Frederick and fish out there? So I did. And I was in the old town Durango, you know, that's all I had. And I had a milk crate with two PVC things for two rods and my fly rod on the front. You know, I wasn't geared up like I am now. <laughs> and uh, it was such a blast. And after that, I started learning. And I started talking with the guys at Mossy Creek Fly, Ship, fly Shop in Harrisonburg. And, you know, they kept telling me about these different flies to use, you know. And I said, okay. So I, I tried them. And then I got hooked up with Chuck Craft flies. I don't know if you've ever heard of Chuck Craft flies. Uh, Boga Bugs. Uh, right now, they're through Eastern Trophies Fly Fishing. Uh, and it's a cork bug. And it's just a bug. And it's got rubber legs. And just to kind of show you here. Oh. It shows here. And then, guys, don't worry. We'll, we'll get to all your questions here in the chat. Yeah. So don't Sorry. worry. And no, then, you're fine. You know, here we got, you know, Ooh, now this one I tied myself. It's a mirror pattern of one of theirs, oh, wow. you know, and made out of wine bottle cork. I actually huh. don't buy my cork. I get wine bottle corks from our local brewery. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to, to, to save on costs because I was just starting out, you know. And so I tie those and I ended up developing. And this is my first ever my own mouse pattern. And if anybody's seen me down at Lake Anna or anywhere else and with the fly rod, I'm throwing this for largemouth bass. That thing looks really, really all right, perfect. Wow. Okay. Is that that's top water, correct? Leather tail. Yeah, this is all top water. This is top water. That and thing's it neat. right on the top. And then I just, you know, I'll let it and make it smack on the water. Make that big splash, just like uh a Zara spook would or a whopper plopper would that first splash, let it sit for a minute and then just twitch it and just twitch it and they'll come up and eat it. And it's great. And then I have since modified the body style. Oh, neat. And huh. that this one's been abused. How much of those that way? What's that? How much of those way? Cause they look pretty big. Yeah, you're not going to throw these with the with a five or a four weight of trout rod. You're going to need okay. a seven or an eight weight. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. You, you probably could get away with a six, but they're they got some weight. I don't know, eighth of an ounce or so. You know, think about a about a about a quarter of a wine bottle cork is what's used to make this. Okay, and then you got uh, a number two or a number four hook. That is really cool. Tail. And yeah, I make these <laughs> in vast amounts. <laughs> and uh, I give some away. I make them. But yeah, that's. That that has to help you, though. Having that experience in fly fishing and tying, that's got to help you when you transition to kayak tournament fishing. Yeah, it did. It, <laughs> it, it, it did a lot. It, it helped me in A, reading the water and understanding what's going on, especially with top water. Uh Subsurface, I like to throw streamers, uh, clousers mainly, uh, and, you know, working with, working off of points. But the problem with going subsurface where those bass are, it's always some sort of structure, some trees or something like that. You you get hung up a lot there. Mm -hmm. and so I stick to the top water with the fly rod. If, if there's no top water bite with the fly rod, then I'm, I go to the what the affectionados of the fly fishing world they call the devil stick and man i'll tell you it, it's great now the uh it's pretty cool you know uh that it, it did help me a lot so, so g g getting back to the tournament yeah you you found kind of these key areas you felt like what you had, I mean, if you spitballed go before the tournament even started, you thought you, you found like what 80 inches plus, which I guess for people at home, that would be probably an average of what 13 to 15 inches per fish, something around there. Well, I didn't, I didn't even get, I don't think I even guessed. I don't, I don't remember if I even guessed, but one of my best friends, Lee Richmond, who I fish with, he was in the tournament and we fished together a lot is he guessed 86 inches. <laughs> on the and he nailed it. I mean, he nailed it. Uh, we talked about, you know, where he was fishing, where I was fishing. 
He fished the same stretch. I fished a little different stretch this year. Uh, and, you know, he, he guessed 86 inches. And I had no idea when I was going in. So we put in. Michelle drops me off first thing in the morning, you know, about 20 after 6 or whatever. She helps me get in. She takes my truck, takes it home. And I go, I just start going around the first curve. And the first curve was just all riffles. I just basically walked it through that. Mm -hmm. And I came down and I came down to the next section. And that's when I first got the first fish of the day. And that was a fall fish. Wow. <laughs> On a whopper yeah. plopper or what? What are we yeah. doing here? 13 inch, 13 Holy inch crap. On a whopper plopper. He ate that thing. I was like, oh, I got a good one. Got, got a good one, right? I thought I did, right? Nope. It's a fall fish. I was like, oh, okay. Well, that kind of. So I was in a section where it was a little, it was fairly deep water, you know, uh, six foot or something like that. Had Had some good sections that were holes in it. And I said, there's got to be more fish in here, you know? So I paddled off to the side, put the kayak on the, on the thing, put my string, my, my cord. And when I'm in the smaller water, I take the cord and I'll put it around my wrist. So the mm-hmm. kayak doesn't go anywhere. Not that it was going anywhere because it was kind of beached. And I just waited out to about my knees and just started fan casting. Smart. You know, the whopper plopper. Bam. You know, I was like, oh, wow, okay. And I was like, and it was pulling. And I said, oh, this ought to be a good one, you know? And I start reeling it in. And I can't remember if that was the 17 or the 16 and a half that I pulled in first. And I was like, okay, I'm on the board. I was, I was excited. I was, I was really, really excited because I mean, all the other tournaments for me have been tough, took me a while. And even with this tournament, even though I was fishing in the vet, here in the valley, I actually had some service too. Mm. So, <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is great. So of course I'm fumbling around, getting them back to the kayak, getting the board out, you know, putting the client, the fish grips on him so he doesn't run away. And he's just meaner and <laughs> all get out, you know, a small mouse get, get him on the board, take my picture, start to upload. And you get that little thing that goes, wee, wee, wee. Oh, my God. I tell you. <laughs> you know, and I'm watching it says 20%, 30%, 40%. Oh, it drove me nuts, you know, because I was pumped, man. I was really excited. It, it's so hard because, like, when I fished the first one at Lake Anna, it's what I, that's what I did is I immediately tried to upload it. And then this tournament, I was like, listen, no. I'm just going to take a bunch of pictures and then I, I, I'll find a section, a time frame just to wait and try to upload them. Cause it, it stresses you out when you catch a nice one and you're just jacked up and then you're sitting there watching that thing load. It's like, Oh my God, I got to get back out there. Yeah. It was like seven o'clock when I got the first one. And then, so you like, got the okay. first one in the boat. Then what? First one in the boat, you know, put them in there. I was like, okay, I didn't even look at the thing. I just uploaded it, you know, and it said it was accepted. And I said, okay, good. I went back. I went right back out to that same spot through again. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Get in the kayak, go down. I didn't go a hundred feet, maybe, maybe 200 feet. So are you on the same stretch? I'm sorry. Do you think you're on the same stretch, like from the same riffle pool? Yeah, Uh, it was the same set of. Flat water. Same flat. Okay. Okay. Same set of flat water. Uh, but this one was come off a rock. The other one was kind of more in a wide open. It had some, it had some ledges in it. This one was a little bit closer to the shore. There was a cliff that came down, and there was a big rock there that I could see under the water. Gotcha. Plopped it right there. Two strokes. Bam! I had another fish on. I was like, oh wow, okay, this is being a good day. You know, I was I was excited. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm just shaking and carry it on. So I bring, bring it in and do the whole thing. But this time I'm in the kayak, you know, I'm floating down the river, you know, and I got this fish on. So as soon as I get the fish into the net, I put the net because I have one of the yak attacks, you know, the folding oh, okay. nets. Okay. And I put the arm underneath my leg and the fish is hanging in the water. I'm paddling off to the shore because I don't want to lose the section of river that I'm in. That, you know? yeah. So I paddled to the shore. Now, keep in mind, 
we did have wind and the wind was blowing us down, it was blowing me down, you know, as fast as it could. You know, it was it was pretty windy, but I got over to shore, you know, did the whole thing. Catch, photo, you know, release, all that fun stuff. Upload, wee, 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 you know, I got two fish, man. I'm home. Take off again. Go down a little further. Um, get stuck up on the rocks, you know. <laughs> Scrape over some low waters. Get stuck up on the rocks again. Pushing off my paddle, pushing off my leg. I get one leg hanging out the kayak. Of course, I have my life jacket on here, and I, I know the river pretty well. And uh, so I'm just kind of hanging out, you know, pushing off. Get down a little further. I don't know. I guess it was... I guess it was probably about 9.30. So you have two in the boat, and then you're basically going, like, what, some hour and some change before your next yeah. bite? That's when the head games start playing. <laughs> you no, know, and then I don't I, – I guess it was about 9.30. I have a picture of it because I took a screenshot of it. About 9.30-ish or so, I get my fish. Was it 9.30? I think it was about 9.30. I get my third fish. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember all the sizes when I got what. You know, because I know there was like two 16 and a halves, a, a 17, 17 and three quarters, 17 and a half, and then the big one. And so I get the third fish, put it on the board, and I'm sitting there in third place. And I took a screenshot of it because I was six. I was awesome. pumped, man. I had three fish. That's more fish than I had in any of the tournaments, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was like, this is this has got to this is so cool. It's such a great day, you know. And I said, well, I can at least get a couple more, even two, two more 12s. I said, I got a good chance of being in the money, you know, because mm -hmm. we had, I don't know, 50 couple. So it was, it was. <sighs> That's awesome. That's really a lot awesome. Of dinks. It was a lot of dinks after that, you know, a lot of dinks. I got frustrated with the dinks on the whopper plopper, started throwing the jerk bait, caught a couple more dinks on that. Then coming down, these two kayakers pat. Well, during that time, my paddle cracks. Okay, and what happened? Okay, well, the paddle I was using was a uh, I can't remember the brand, but it was an old one. It's like fifteen years old. Mm -hmm. Same as same as just a kayak. You know, it was one of those aluminum paddles, and right where you click in, where it locks in place there there was a stress crack all the way around, except for maybe about a half an inch. Mm. And I was, I saw it and I'm like freaking out. You know, I'm like, Oh my God, I don't need this thing breaking. And I still had like three quarters of my float to do, you know? And I knew I had bunch, I had some rock ledges. I had a couple small waterfalls I needed to go over. You know, I was just like, ah, I don't know. So I called Michelle up. And said, "Hey, go to the house. In my big, in my good kayak is my good paddle. Go get it. And uh, you know that's my carbon fiber. And I said, go get it and meet me at this other at the spot. So she said, I'm eating lunch right now. You know, and I'm like, okay, take an hour, hour and a half, whatever. I can fish that time. Go ahead. So she goes, and does that. Well, I'm coming down, and then these two kayakers." come down and uh these you can get kayak. your phone that's no big deal yeah no <laughs> this this is not this is not one of them polished i can't ones. remember the name his name right off the top of my head oh you're fine on and then to everybody in the chat don't worry we're going to get all to your questions here shortly we're going to finish out this this section of the interview and then we're going to get to all oh. your questions uh but again please like and subscribe to the channel i want to really pump this in the algorithm we have four likes right now on the page but there's about 20 of you watching at one point so come on everyone hit that like button it really helps me out anyway back to the story yes yeah, so uh these two kayak well a couple other kayakers had passed me you know regular people you know just floating down the river and I let them get on through. And then these two kayakers come up and they're in this, the one guy's in, uh, it looked like a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, can't think of the name of his kayak, but it was uh, James Coleman. 
And uh-huh. I didn't know who he was. Okay. He he asked me, are you fishing a tournament? Cause I guess he saw my three rods and you know, my net and all that. And I said, yeah. And uh, I'm still kind of fishing with it. And I catch a fish and I'm reeling it in, you know, and he, he's there, he's watching me do it. And, you know, he was excited for me and I, I pull it in and he, he doesn't really, I don't think we introduced each other by name yet, you know, so we don't know each other. We just, you know, we'll know we're fishing a tournament. And, uh, we, uh, I, I, but it takes it under the boat one way, then back under the boat that way and this way and that way a couple of times. I said, oh, please hang on, please hang on, please hang on. Finally, get it in the net, get it in the net. And I asked him, I said, would you mind taking a picture for me? And uh, we would, uh, you know, I'll get it from you later, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> you know, and that's when I did, told him my name, you know, and uh, so he, he was very nice and took a picture for me. So I got a picture of me holding that one fish and, you know, and my full kayak, you know, so that, that was really cool. That was I was excited because that was that was my fourth fish, you know. We got one and, left. Yeah, one more left. And I, I think that was like a 17, that one. And uh I was like, you know, and I was like, okay. And so he and I asked him kind of where he took out. He said a little further down. I said, okay, kind of where he was doing. So he started above me. And wow, he caught up and then they went on further because it was getting closer. I think now it was like 1130 or something like that. Maybe. And so him and his buddy, I'm not sure who it was. And I, I'm sorry. I don't remember the name. Uh, They, they went on down past me and I fished some more. And then it wasn't long after that. I'm still with this cracked paddle, you know, and I'm like, Mm. I, I told her it'd be an hour or so before I met her. And, I'm like, uh, oh, start getting threw out again. Bam, number five. And number five turned out to be my 18 incher. And I was pretty Dang. excited. I was like, yes. Dude. You know, I got five fish, you know. And I'm like, oh my God, I got it was so good. It was so good. And uh how did you catch them? Like, it's so crazy because I feel like people mostly got their their good bites early in the day. It sounds like you got years later. Yeah, I mean, I got you know, I got the timestamps on all when they, when they came in and, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was about one and a, maybe one an hour. Wow. You know, uh, of a good fish. It was, a, it was a good stretch of water. That's all I got to say. I'm sorry. I'm not telling anybody where it is. Sorry, but you know, it's on the North Fork. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's the thing too. We've talked about this on live streams before. When you're dealing with the river, it is more about sections and within those sections, you can figure it out. I, I mean, it, it really is. If you want to pre-fish one of these things, you got to just get put your time in and float it. And that's the nice thing about river fishing in that sense where there's nothing. You don't have to have a crazy magic bait in general. You just got to put time in and float. Once you find a section that has them in this time of year, they're going to be there. And you, you just got to figure them out. Well, you know, this is this is common knowledge. And I've posted it on my Facebook page, all my friends and stuff. Is I fish down at uh, Seven Bends uh, State Park. The mm-hmm. new state park down here. And I fished that, I wade fished that a lot. And that's where I did a lot of studying and a lot of, you know, and I've caught 15 to 17 inches there, just right there, you know, wading, you know. Uh, so they're, you know, they're in there. They're in there. You just got to figure out where they're at and find them and work. But like I said, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. So I got my fifth fish. Time is moving along. You know, I'm trying to get closer and I see where I told her I'd meet her. And as I'm paddling up to meet her to get the paddle, this is, I don't know, 130, quarter to two. And just as I move up to the thing, my paddle breaks. Mm. I got two, two pieces. Luckily, I'm pushing in the shore. And I just called it quits and said, it's going to be however it is. And after I got my fifth fish, I will be honest, I did take a picture of the standings. And I won't say where I was, because it ate on me all day long. 
so I get out and then I guess Mike posts about he's delaying the awards, you know, here we're all wait. I'm wait. I'm excited. Seven o'clock. Okay. Because he took down the board at like two o'clock, you know, so nobody could see. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh my God, is my going to hold up? Am I going to hold up? Well, you know, of course Mike had that incident and, you know, I'm glad everybody is safe there because, you know, the rivers, the rivers can be, because I've fished a rat before. So I know what he went through. I know what a lot of guys went through. I'm actually fly fishing the wrap here on the second. I'm going to fly fish for small mouse on the wrap on the second of July. I, I was going to say, like, I had a couple of questions for you, but then again, a, a, the quick break is guys, again, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out with the algorithm. We have eight likes right now. We need two more for 10. Come on. There's over, we're getting close to 20 people watching on Facebook and YouTube. Can we get out of the 20? Can we get two more, please? Come on, guys. Um, like yeah. Please. Because this guy has a really, really good information to just to drop on us here. Did you know you were going to fish the Shenandoah? Because you can fish the Upper Potomac, the Shenandoah, or the Rap. And it seems like when I look back at the history of this tournament, a ton of dudes always did well in the Rappahannock. It looks like statistically a lot of guys. Oh, the rap, the rap. There's no doubt. I thought the I thought the winner would come from the Rap. I really did. I thought the winner would come from the Rap. I really believe there's bigger fish in the Rap. Uh, but you know. It was kind of me and, you know, I live on the North Fork. I'm stubborn, <laughs> you know, and yeah, amen. I wanted to win it on the North Fork. I wanted to show that the North Fork, you know, because people just think about the North Fork and say, oh, it's just low water. It's a little stream. It's not very technical. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a little challenging to get to public put-ins and takeouts because there's a lot of private property, you know, but if you do your research, you will find those places. You know, bridge abutments, uh, you know, there, there's lots of places there. You know, there's a couple of the North, Friends of the North Fork has a couple. You know, there's uh, there's another one, a public landing uh, up by Chapman's Landing one. Uh, you know, so there are places to put in and take out. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, I just wanted to do the North Fork and Lee, Lee Richmond the same way. You know, he he's the same way. You know, he he fished in. He fished the North Fork too. And he was like me, you know, hey, we want to do that. And Lee, I hope you're watching. I told you I'd shout out to you. Yeah, <laughs> we got a couple. So Scott says, Amen. I'm an Upper Potomac homer. An individual actually came, I think, in third fishing the Upper Potomac, which was insane because our conditions were shite down where we were at. It started to get bad. <laughs> I've never fished the Upper Potomac and I'd love to do it, but I don't know it. So I'd have to get somebody to say, Hey, let's go sometime. Yeah, it, I'm it's willing to go, you know. Yeah, that's the thing, is it really is you gotta know the place based on the conditions that you were faced with. That's elite stuff, Lee. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, like you you did it. Um, like and that was the thing, like the North Fork, like I didn't know if the Shenandoah could do it. I just didn't know if it was gonna set up for it. Um, and then yeah, I mean, you proved everybody wrong because you got the right bites. And this is something like my the guy that taught me, you don't need to catch a bunch, you just need to catch the right five. And it's yeah. so hard when you're given three rivers to be like, dude, you still just need to catch five stupid fish of the right size. You the don't fish have to gods catch were looking down on me. The fish gods were looking down on me that day. You know, it was, it was, they were looking down on me. That's all I can say. You know, to have, it was your moment Yeah, to have those quality fish. And, you know, I mean, I was giddy. I was so, that's the only term I can use. So giddy all the way up until awards. And on Sunday, I went out, we went out fishing. We went over, we were going to go to Lake Frederick. Then we changed our mind and went up to Lake Laura. And uh, I took Michelle fishing in the John boat and we got blown away. You know, I mean, the, the mm -hmm. wind was just blowing us. So we called it quits, but we're out in the middle of the lake when Mike does the awards, you know, and our service is like hardly anything when you're up there at Bryce, you know, and it was spotty and we couldn't tell. I was just so giddy. And I let out a big whoop when he announced it. I was like, yes, yes, you know, I was just, I was just, and I, I went, at, we got done. We packed it up, packed it in, went over to Woodstock Brew House, had, had a beer, had a couple of beers, celebrated with the crew there, a bunch of our friends. And, you know, it was, I've been on cloud nine since then. You know? How big's a trophy? Uh, How big's a trophy are you going to give you? 
I don't know. <laughs> I, I, Dude, that we... no trophy that I know of. I just know it's a it's a good chunk of change, which yeah, and this is this is something that I'll probably do. I and I didn't do it this time. Usually I, I have a, a fisheye camera that I run. Oh cool. Have you heard of those fish eyes? Yeah, it, it's pretty good, but I'm it it's just consistently filming and I didn't take it with me. So all I had was my cell phone to take my pictures. Uh, but uh, I wished I had that on video. The uh, So I'm probably, with, with my winnings, I'm probably going to get a GoPro. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> you know? Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's probably what I'm going to do is, go get a, is get a GoPro. Now I got to decide whether I want to have it as a stern mount looking back in front of me or looking facing me for the next time. The biggest thing is make sure just keep power going to it. Cause I know I had two running and sometimes man, you, you get in the heat of the moment and you forget they, they, they shut off. I have uh, the Yolo tech battery pack. Good. And that I use on my fish eye. So I'm going to use that for oh, that, the GoPro. That'll work great then. Yeah. And then so. So now we do have a couple of questions that came in here. Yes. So we got, uh, let's see which ones we'll go with here. Uh, we got Scott again, glad my $40 went to this guy. <laughs> Amen, Scott. And then let's see, let's get, we got a couple more here. Let's see. Here's a good one. Big body Bassin. Where are the good river spots in the Shenandoah and Clark Loudoun County? Uh, big body Bassin. Do you mean uh, from the bank oh, or to paddle? Because if you're fishing from the bank, it's pretty much, I would say like Route 7, uh, right there at Route 7. Also, before you go to Route 7, if you're going from Loudoun County out, you take a right. Shenandoah owns an old golf course. They turn into like a walking area, and there's some bank access there. So uh, if you're still in the chat, hopefully that helps. But that's the bank access. If you want some river spots, like from the kayak, be more specific. I mean, you can float from 7 down. I did that once with my wife, and it takes like two days. <laughs> To go from seven all the way down, it's a long float. You can also go above seven and, and drop into Watermelon Park. That's a pretty good float for the Shenandoah. Um, let's see here. Got another one. Joshua, I'm going to butcher your name because I'm terrible with this. Joshua Holman. Uh, I'm one of the lucky friends, LOL. <laughs> yep, yep. So, yep. okay, you know well, that. Oh, yeah, well, he, he gave me he gave me some he gave me some good pork barbecue the other day, so uh, I think I owe him a, a river trip. That's probably what did it then. <laughs> Christopher Sherwood, love fishing the Shenandoah, but the Outer Banks is like dying and going to fishing. Hell. Yes, Chris. Yes. Outer Banks is fishing Mecca. If you had to pick between fishing only saltwater the rest of your life, though, or fishing rivers and streams around here, what would you have to pick? Rivers and streams. Rivers and streams, really? Yeah. Oh yeah. The thing about the thing about fishing in salt water is uh everything pretty much travels in schools. Mm. You know, so there's either no fish or fish. No fish or fish. You know, uh going to you know the rivers and streams. They're everywhere, you know. You just mm -hmm. got to find out. Yeah, Ashley, exactly. Yeah, hundred percent. They stack up. Yeah, and I see it pop up on the screen there. Exactly. You yeah. Can nibble and then catch ten fish in twenty minutes. Huge yeah, shout out, actually. One. No, it, it, and that's the thing about rivers. I think it's so crazy. Like, cause like something I was going to ask you, like, why is it some people get so frustrated? I remember Mike talking about that in the meeting before we got started, that some people get frustrated with these tournaments. What do you think the frustration is with people that fish for smallmouth and rivers? Um, growing up with it, growing in Loudoun County where I just did this growing up, I feel like I'm colorblind to it. What do you think gives anglers such a hard challenge when they go from Lake Anna to, to the upper Potomac or the Shenandoah? Um, you're you're dealing with different currents the current the water flow mm -hmm. that's that's what i think you know it, it it's how the water flows you know how it you got rocks you got boulders you got ledges you know especially in the north Fork. i mean the ledges are like this you know they're diagonal they're not straight up or you got a big overhanging ledge like that they're all diagonal and you probably went through some of them uh, on your trip is, you know, you get stuck on one, 
five feet, two, three feet later, you're stuck on another one and you're stuck on another one in a low water situation. Mm -hmm. But in those cuts, they, they'll run, they'll hide, you know? Uh, so those, sometimes those cuts are not places to, to ignore as well. And I also think it's, it's, I think people get, I don't even know how to word this correctly. Big small mouth, they, especially in this gin clear water, like the part I was fishing was chocolate milk, but generally speaking, if you're drifting, and this is my thought, you're fishing it almost wrong because you're going downstream and you're it, generally, if you don't know what you're doing, you're casting downstream and bringing it back. You're drifting your boat probably over the best stuff and you're spooking them. And so when you see an area, I, I kind of approach oh, like you're on a fish. Yeah. Like you got to think about I, if you see the juice, you got to think like you're either bone fishing on the flats or for trout. You got to get off, walk around and think about there's one sitting right there and you don't want to spook it. And I think people don't understand that if they just float a river, like how fish position. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, remember, they're they're looking up, you know, they're looking up most of the time up river, you know, looking up river. They see something splash and they'll chase it. Oh, I meant to tell you it was the most exciting part about the 18 incher. Sorry. Yeah, no, go for it. Go for it. Reminded me was when I cut the 18 incher, I threw the whopper plopper, right? And as soon as it landed, I twitched it. He hit it. I missed him. I start popping it back in. He hits it again. I missed him again. He hits it a third time. I finally get him. And he chased it. He chased it probably 10, 15 yards. Or she chased it, whatever. But you know, it it chased it, and I mean, I had three chances on that boy, mm. and it was it was pretty cool to watch. I really wish that one would have been on video somewhere because that was just so kaploosh, you know, kaploosh, kaploosh, and he chased it, and he chased it through the ripples. Now, one thing that I noticed, uh, something I don't, I didn't mention about looking down the rivers, and this goes for the rap, it, it, probably the Upper Potomac or whatever. If you see rocks and you know how the word goes around the rocks and then it makes that clear stagnant water, toss your whopper plopper or your jerk bait or even your wacky rig or what or your Ned rig or whatever you're using, toss it in the light colored area of that. Oh. Okay. That toss it in the light colored area. There that's where the fish are gonna hide. You know, they're gonna be sitting there. Why is that? Because that's where the slack water is. They're not. You expending all that energy in a fast water. They'll jump out into the fast water to grab something moving by and then come back in. You know, uh, you know, that's what I found. And, and the same thing if you're fly fishing, those are the targets that I, I target with the fly rod. The other thing, uh, on clear days, especially when it gets it later on into the day, into the afternoons, look for the shadows of the trees. I think you brought that up not long ago in one of your, uh, yeah, I, I mean, shows, you brought that up. Look, yeah. you know, right there when you get to the top of the day, that sun's beating down. Look for those that shade line. You know, work that shade line. Uh, last year, um, the all the fish hang out there. Last year, I went fly fishing for carp, and we, you know, through the brood X hatch, and I caught nine carp that day, and one of them was a citation, and. It, that's where they were. They were over into that shaded area, up close up against the bank in that shaded area. And the same thing with the small mouse. We were catching small mouse on these flies. These cork flies are are, are money. I'm telling you, it's money. If you're into fly fishing, a cork fly is money. And the big thing is don't worry about a fancy presentation. You're not fishing for trout here. Mm -hmm. You're fishing for bass. And bass like to see that plop, that splat. They call it a splat. And don't worry about, I'll probably catch heck from this from other people, but other fly guys, but don't worry about a big old tippet. Make sure you're using two, nothing less than 2X. Nothing less than 2X tippet, okay? Uh, I usually just use about an eight, eight, four to eight foot section of mm -hmm. eight pound test oh, wow. as, as my leader onto my fly line. You don't have to have a big fancy roll. You know, it's just got a, when I'm doing the top order stuff like this, it's just got a plot mm -hmm. and then circuit in, I, you know, it's, it's fun. 
It's fun. And I love fly fishing and I'll go back to it. I just had to win this one. And I knew by the past experience of last year that I couldn't chance losing any fish. I had to land every fish I got. And, and I did I did lose a couple. I did and, lose a couple. But that's the nature of smallmouth. Like you're you're not it's hard to be perfect when you're dealing with smallmouth. Um so oh my god, we got a lot of questions here. Let's try to bang through some yeah. of these. Uh let's see. Uh Randall Grove. Randall, yes, son, thank you. North you are Fork. the man, buddy. You are the man. Thank you. I I owe him a lot for this trip. We sat the night night before, two nights before, sat there on Google Earth going over what fish, what sections to hit, where to hit it, where what to stay, what to avoid. You know, watch that. Yeah, you're the man, bud. Thank you. Thank this you, Randall. You. I got you. You know what we talked about. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. We got so many. Uh, Ashley, again, the fish like to sit in the eddies and the rocks. Yes, they do. Um, but they also, I think the bigger ones also want access to deep water. I think it's more Bassmaster Magazine saying they always are up super shallow. They want to also have access to the deep in general, I think. So don't always just fish the big eddies. Look for those specific juice spots where like there's deep water somewhere nearby. Um, especially if you get a, a riffle to a sharp break, that's that's juice watch, wherever. Watch that run. You, want, you know, where where that water breaks right in there. If you can mm. get your lure, your fly, whatever, in that in that run right there you'll probably get a hit. You'll probably get a hit, whether it's a little one or a big one. Meredith, this guy loves to fish. So, <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> he also is, a, a his bank account's a little bit bigger now, too. Uh, let's see. Uh, which lake are you going to fish next derby? Uh, I'm not telling. Uh, so there you Maybe go. Maybe I fished last year, probably. So, yeah. And then <laughs> I don't know. I'm actually, I have no idea. I'm going to pre-fish the week before. I have to go to ICAST in Orlando. So I'm going to fly straight in to fish the tournament. I'm going to leave my kayak with somebody down there probably and just basically wing it probably. <laughs> so it, it's going to be no sleep, but it's going to be fun. Uh, let's see, Ashley, again, since you fly fish, have you heard of the South Huddleston, South Holston, I guess Holston River in Northeast Tennessee? It's a fly fishing Mecca. Yep, so. I've heard of it. Uh, never gotten to fish it. Uh, that would be cool. Uh, I've fished the uh, Great Smoky Mountains uh, up through Gatlinburg, over to Cherokee, fished all that, but never gotten to do the Holston. What is a place that you really want to trout fish, though? Like if you had a bucket list item for places that you would want to trout fish? Somewhere out in Colorado. Just oh, really? For, for cut, cut throats, just to say I did it. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. That sounds really, really you cool. You know, that's, that's, you know, or, you know, second one was, and I don't think I'll ever do it, is go to Argentina. But, you know, I, in the U.S., I I, I want to go fish cutthroats. What, what type of trap do they have in Argentina? Is it uh, rainbows, big ones. Big ones? Wow. <laughs> that sounds really, really cool. <laughs> but, yeah, that's, uh, I don't think that'll happen. But, you know, it, you can always dream, right? You can always dream, like win the lottery. <laughs> well, hey, if you keep catching five fish, every time you catch five, right now, statistically, every time you catch a limit, you win. I'm just happy I got on the board, really. that's That was my pure excitement that I got on the board. Because the, the most, last year at Lake Anna, I got, I got one fish the night before, a 14-incher, and then, the next day, I just got a bunch of dinks, didn't catch nothing. This year, I went to Lake Anna, and I ended up two fish. And I actually, I think I was a spot ahead of you, Thomas. I think you were. At, at that one spot, you know, I think I had maybe an inch bigger fish. And I was like, well, at least I didn't get skunked, and I got fish on the board. That was a tough tournament, you know? too. Uh, that that was that was tough. I had, I, but I actually... For that tournament, see, I ran a top order 120, P, a non PDL, just paddle version. Okay. And for the and on the first on the first trail stop, the Potomac, another windy one, not too windy, but it was windy. Man, I got tired of paddling and with the winds and everything. And I said, you know what? 
I put a trolling motor on it and I, you know, I did the whole thing, mounted it up. You can see pictures on my Facebook page and stuff is, uh, you know, I put pedal steering on it and I took it out to Anna and that was a big thing that got me out outside. I fished Christopher run and I got outside of, outside of the, that, that tributary there as Christopher run went around to the bridge. I got two fish there within five minutes of each other. And I was excited because I got on the board, you know, that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, and then of course, you know, I, I had a good day. I was, I was pumped on that one. And then I knew this one was coming up. I went to the, uh, we went to the get together over at Tim's and met a few of the guys that I hadn't met before. And, uh, you know, it was like, you know, I, I think I even told Mike about the story of, of, of the Shenandoah last year, you know, winning and losing. And I set my focus on this tournament. This was going to be my tournament. And, mm -hmm. you know, luckily from, you know, God willing, I, I was able to pull it off. And you did it and, and you did it. And, and again, you're right about the kayak too, about yeah, I, again, me pedaling in the last one and this one, based on how I did this one, I was pedaling all day. My God, you need a trolling motor. Cause I mean, I got some ripped calves after two events, just pedaling all freaking day. Uh, I, I feel like you just need one just to be more efficient on the water. Yeah. The, uh, there was one. <clears throat> so remember I talked about the gentleman who, uh, took, took my picture. Yeah. You know, he came in second place. You know that. Really? Yeah. Well, that's a cool tip to the story. And he James texted, Coleman. He texted, yep. He texted me after that because after he sent me the pictures, and he said, "I knew I was on. We were on the right side of the the right river." You know, and I mean, that I thought that was really cool. It was really kind of a neat thing. I thought that was really a neat thing. Was that? we were both the top two were on the same river, same section. And we were able to pull out those kinds of fish. I, I yeah. Like the fact that Shannon Doe, because think about this, you got you in first place, Shannon Doe. We got James in second place, Shannon Doe. Then we got, I apologize. I'm going to butcher your name. My deepest apology. Chun was in third place, upper Potomac. If you he told me big fish though. Yeah. Like, I, you, if you put a gun to my head, I thought it would be Rappahannock would be somewhere in the top three, not the Shenandoah and Upper Potomac. So that's just so cool to see that there's health there. I mean, hell, even if, if I actually landed everything, I would have been in the top 10. So we'd have a lot more people than the Shenandoah. And I am I have a point to this. Do you think the Shenandoah is now, is it on, is it back? Can we officially say that? Um, I know back when I was a kid, there were so much lesions and fish kills and it was so bad for a while. Where, where do you think the river is now? I think it's in good shape. I don't think it's fully back to where, you know, days of lore was. Uh, but I think it's in good shape. I mean, the the South Fork fishes always fishes really well. You you get good fish. You get good numbers there. Same thing with the main step. You know, I mean, last year I fished it. I fished the main step. And I think it was 50 to 7, that area, you know. And I caught some decent fish there you know i was fly fishing you know I, I probably don't get the numbers that a spin guy would but i you know i think i caught 20 or 30 fish and i was carp fishing that day <laughs> yeah. randall grove good shape but not what it was I, I think it's coming back i really do i think we're a couple of spawn classes away um from it being back to to i think in a good in a good place I really well, we don't have no major floods yeah we need, we need to have this rain quit in the springtime. Let's see. Steve, Rappahannock and Madsen countries offer some of the best overall trout streams in the common. I, You know, we're going to have some more people on uh, specifically about trout streams. If you guys didn't realize from the John Odenkirk thing, we talked about snakeheads. This is not just bass fishing. I want everything in the area. So I want to get some good people on the show to talk about the opportunities for fly fishing. Uh, I love fly fishing in the park. Shenandoah National Park is great. Really? It's great. It, 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 there's, there's a lot of good streams there. A lot of good streams. And, you know, you got to do a little hiking, you know, to get to some of the better fishing. But, I mean, you can have 50 fish days. 
I mean, you're not talking big fish, you know, you're talking yeah. four inch to other, but the beauty, I mean, well, here, I don't know. Let me see if I Oh, go for it. Go for it. I'm a, I'll answer some more questions while you grab some stuff. Can you see that? Oh, I can. That's a brookie from the. Wow. That's park. beautiful. And that, uh, of course, that's my citation. Uh, yellow perch from McLaura, but. <laughs> cool. But uh, there, I just didn't want to. But yeah, that's. Let's see. What did you use? Which person? All right. Well, I guess we could both go. Uh, so what did we use to catch? Uh I used, I had three baits keyed in where I was. I went, I had to go chartreuse and black uh, crankbait. I had a Strike King square bill for the shallower poles. And I used a Strike King uh, chartreuse with a black back that I did a little bit deeper bill for the deeper holes. And then my backup baits was a micro swim bait with a spin head and then a power Ned rig. I like to go June bug because I think it looks more like the Mad Tom catfish. Uh, and I also had a, a wacky worm on, but the problem is it was just too chalk. It was bad. <laughs> it was it was bad where we were at. Um, I haven't I have not fished the river that rough in a while where it was white caps. It, it was gnarly down where we were at. I don't know if it, it blew that bad where you guys were at, but at least for the guys I was talking to, it was insane. No, it, it blew us around, but it didn't it didn't blow give us white caps and you know, didn't give us any rough water. It was, it was pretty smooth. There was a lot of areas that were smooth, but then again, in, in our, my, our section, it, it, I had mountains on this side, hills on this side, mm -hmm. you know? So, excuse me, we were down into the, I mean, it had got some trees on both sides or cliffs, you know? So it was, it was, it was pretty good. Uh, uh, what I used, uh, I said earlier is, uh, I used the Whopper Plopper 75, uh, Monkey butt and I know it. Tell you, I don't, I don't mind. Monkey butt and I know it. Those are the two patterns I use. I used, I used my own pattern of jerk bait. Lost a bunch of small ones on that. Uh, caught a lot of small ones on the jerk bait, and then I used a wacky rig. Uh, what, what is your wacky rig setup? Generally speaking, are you going with a? Uh, well, I mean, what worm do you like to use? What type of hook do you like to use? Well, a lot of. Most of the time I fish a green pumpkin okay. or I fish a purple pumpkin. It's uh purple. I just actually ordered a new one. Uh, I get who is, I can't remember the guy. I just spoke with him tonight too, uh, who makes them, but. Oh, wow. It's got a purple flake in it. And it's purple. That's beautiful. With, purple with green pumpkin in there, but. Yeah, and then I just it was uh, like a one out hook, and just and and I use I used a rubber ring, okay? okay, and I used a rubber ring because, and I and I kind of hook it through a little bit of the of the worm, otherwise because the smallmouth will pull it out in a heartbeat, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, but that just toss it out there, no weight, just toss it, you know, and like I said. The whopper plopper. If they miss the whopper plopper, I followed it up with, with the with the with the pumpkin wacky rig, and that accounted for uh, two. I he did the wacky accounted for two scoring bass after the whopper plopper miss. And, and the, the wacky worm is so important to have when the river is clear. It really is. Like you, you gotta have that in your arsenal. And uh, so that that was. That was it. It was just, it was just a great day, man. That's all I can say. Um, no. it, was, it was, it was just so much fun. It was a little scary about the, about the broken paddle. And, you know, a couple of times I got stuck and that paddle's cracked and I'm thinking it's going to crack even more. And then I'm going to have two paddles and I'm going to sit there like, you know, like this and then like this, you know, and I'm in a sit in too, not a sit on top, but a sit in, you know? Uh, so, but, yeah, it was that that was the scariest part, but it was pretty cool. Yeah, I think it, it was really cool. But sir, I mean, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I, we're all caught up on all the chats, which was fantastic for for you being a stay for us to answer all these questions. I mean, the last thing I try to ask all my guests, like, what's another like goal you have for this year? Place in another tournament. Okay. Another trail stop. Place get. Get my five fish in place. 
That's okay. all. That's that's my goal. You know, I, it's fun. Like I said, I started last year. I'm enjoying it. It's a lot of fun to do. Uh, looking forward to the Battle of the Five Lakes, you know, uh, that's coming up here. Uh, probably going to pre-fish it here once or twice. Uh, see how, how that goes. How far is that for you? Hour and a half, hour and a half. depending on which one you go. Okay. Most of most of the trips are an hour and a half. This one's in my backyard. This one was my five minute one. Everything else is an hour and a half. I, you know, I live over in Shenandoah Valley, Woodstock. There's, you know, nothing really close. Uh, you know, but it's okay. You know. No, I, I, I feel you. Little, I got a little money to pay for gas this year. You know, it almost bought. You do. Now. You do. <laughs> you know, I drive a Dodge pickup truck, a Hemi, and you know it. it <laughs> uh, but. Uh, I got a new one this year, so that that a newer one to me. But uh, I used to have a, I ran around in a big orange Dodge, you know, with two hundred eighty-seven thousand miles in it last year, and this year I got a newer one, so I can I can make it to the events. <laughs> well, I just want to say congratulations, and and not to you, but to everyone that fished the Shenandoah this year and to make it represent, because again, guys, I, I literally grew up on the Shenandoah, so it's so cool to see the rivers back. Uh, and, and like, and I mean, back is like, you can catch nice ones now for God's sakes. The top two were Shenandoah, upper Potomac. These are places I fished and you couldn't do this back in 2008, 2009. So it's just so cool to be like, oh yeah, you can go out there and you can catch a fish of a lifetime. Now the Shenandoah. There's, there's one thing I do want to say, and this, this goes to all the members of the club ever since I've been in it, everybody has been so welcoming, you know, mm -hmm. they'll talk, they'll help you out, you know, they'll, you know, friendly. I, I've fished with a couple of them, you know, uh, through, you know, becoming friends and seeing them on the water at different events and stuff. And it, the, I love the club. It's great. It, it's so much fun. And if you get a chance to do it and you want to do it, it, for those that are not, or are just watching out, it's, it's good. It, it's a good club. It's a good club. Uh, and, uh, you know, communication is good. A uh, couple. Oh, on the Potomac, just to bring it up. Sorry, I didn't mean to take up too much no, time. No, no, you but take up as much time as you want. After the Potomac trip, uh, apparently I didn't, for whatever reason, my phone or whatever didn't log me out of the water. I'm driving back, I uh, get home, and Mike gives me a call and says, Hey, Lee, I see you didn't get checked out of the water. Are you out? Everything okay? You know, they're checking up on you. That's awesome. You know, out. That meant a lot, you know, that, that really did. And, uh, you know, the guys are there to, uh, pick things up. No, they're a great club. And I've really enjoyed just getting a part of this community coming from just tournament bass boats and stuff. This is an interesting culture to be delved in for the first time. Uh, and so far I just, I'm really enjoying it. And, you know, again, you know, thank you so much for coming on. If you ever want to come back on the show again, just to talk about the Shenandoah River or just even fly fishing, like I, I would love to have you on just to talk fly fishing for yeah, an hour. Be glad, be glad to. But, uh, uh, wait till yeah. after the second, after July second, I'm going on a going on a guided trip. Uh, Fun. With Eastern trophies fly, Eastern trophies fly fishing. Okay, uh, and uh, we'll probably probably do the wrap. I don't know. Maybe Ooh. do the Shenandoah. Maybe do the upper Potomac. I don't know. It depends on what he feels is fishing the best. And it, it it's a fly trip. It's an all day fly trip. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I've done it twice now. And well, last year I did it, we did it for carp during the brood X harp um, hatch. And that was awesome. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, a lot of times I just go out on my own fly fishing, you know, uh, a lot of times when I'm fishing, I'm, I'm out by myself. If, if Lee Richmond don't go with me, I'm by myself. So if anybody shouts shouts at me or whatever, needs a partner or wants to wants to come up, you know, we can figure out something, do some logistics. We'll fish. I fish. I fish a lot on Saturdays and Sundays. So, <laughs> well, sir, if I'm ever down your way, I'll definitely give you a holler too, since I'm just up 81. But guys give him a follow, give him a follow on social media, give this guy, I'm rooting for him the rest of the season. Hopefully uh, this next tournament plays out for you and good luck on your guided trip. Great. Thank you. And Thomas, uh, keep up the good work, man. I love the show. Oh, thank love you so show. much. I really Great. appreciate it. And again, yeah, thank you so much. There you have it guys. Mm -hmm. Lee Wells. He is the winner of the, the, the bronze back challenge. That was awesome. I learned a lot. 
Um, I'm going to try to catch up on all the chats here just to make sure I didn't miss any. But isn't that cool? Just having a river guy on it's his first time winning a place. And it, we've all been there. I've won my first tournament and it's surreal. It's like, I'm assuming it's like having the birth of your first child, winning your first tournament. You know, don't ever tell that to your firstborn, but I feel like it's kind of there. Like it's going to just stick in your memory forever. It's just so cool. And to be able to do that on your home water, like that's nuts. Like I don't think I could win on the, on the Shenandoah part I fish because I fish it too much. It just gets in your head. And he was able to do it and to show off the river. And that's just that's just so cool to me because, again, I keep harping on it. I remember catching fish with lesions all over their bodies and never catching big ones. And then you look at it and we're talking about the Shenandoah and the Ever Potomac actually contending for tournaments now. Like, that's pretty that's pretty cool. And that's now imagine in five, six, seven years as the rivers gets healthier, what we could do. And if we could just get some people to help us out, maybe do a little bit of stocking programs, maybe some rehabilitation habitat stuff. I really feel like there's an opportunity that we could actually get and get this river back to where it needs to be. But yeah, let me just catch up on some super chat or some super chats. Hi, I wish I had super chats. Uh, catch up on a couple of messages here. And if there's a message you guys have for me real quick, if you would like me to answer it, please let me know and I'll try to get it, uh, get it done for you here. Uh, but then this will air next week as well. So if you missed this on the live stream, do not worry about it. You can catch this next week. Uh, Upper Potomac, Scott, amen. Upper Potomac, Homer. Yep, absolutely. Uh, we got Meredith. Yep, we just hit that one. No problem. We got Steve Garman. Steve, come visit us at Ben's Diner. Absolutely, Steve. I think we'd both love to come visit you down there sometime. Uh, let's see. I be 50, retired disability. That means you can go fishing a lot more, dude. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. We got a couple more here. Steve Garman fished uh merton's town brooks va north fork shenandoah today great success i do want to get into trout fishing i really do i actually should like talk to fish hawk see if i can get him to actually teach me how to do it um since he's a a, a trout connoisseur let's see we got mr webb in the house thoughts on the walleye population on the shenandoah uh the walleye population is actually on the uptick i know talking to kingfish king kingfisher's guide service he was actually possibly in talks of shooting a, a TV show with some people on the Shenandoah, especially I think around Harper's Ferry, because the walleye population is on is on the uptick. Um, it's coming. It's really coming. And I think the, the issue is you have so many predators right now on the river. It just has to level out. Um, the only way you're going to get bigger, the bigger predators is if there's enough food to actually sustain them all to have that growth. And so I think if we get a good spawn class, we get better, a better shiner population. I think you're going to see a real big uptick, not only in the walleye, but also in the smallmouth side as well. Um, and that's just what is important is you need to see the balance in the ecosystem to come there. And wasn't that cool though, that everybody in the top of the field, even the people that didn't do well, like they were all fishing kind of the same thing. And I thought that was really cool. Cause like, to me, I thought I was off, but a lot of the baits I was throwing the jerk bait color, stuff like that, that's stuff I like to throw. Uh, what you key in on. We're all keying in on the same stuff. And, and that also shows me about fishing, how it is like the keys to victory, success or failure. It's such little things like a person that loses the tournament probably has the same mindset as the winner, but it's just, everything has to go just right for you. And that's what makes this sport so much fun. Um, it's just, it's just really, really cool stuff there. Let's see. I think I got all the questions there. Ooh, here's another good question. Big body Basson is Harper's Ferry good. Harper's Ferry fishing is good if you can access it just below Harper's Ferry. You know, let me pull that up real quick on the old map. That's a good way to kind of end in the show right here. Let me get that up there. Boom. So this is kind of the Harper's Ferry area. Harper's Ferry down below the ferry. There's a lot of good fishing. It's just being able to actually like get there is the issue. Uh, big Bassin. Um, if you can actually launch a kayak, I would assume you're going to have to launch it from uh the the maryland side here but if you can get a kayak or a boat down into this section right here before the riffles it is it, it is good fishing and i think one reason it makes it good besides the two rivers going together is it's just so hard to actually get access to it um the other really good area is actually down here by brunswick shall i show you the place that i was pre-fishing oh crap so Right down here, I would launch from Point of Rocks, and I was going to float all the way to fish the backside of this island. This backside of this island is usually really good for me for a couple. 
And then I was going to try to float or pedal. And this is why I said like, this was just going to be a long ass float. Where the hell is it right here? So basically the entrance to the Monocacy, uh, right through here, you know, this, this whole stretch, I really felt like it was, it, it's really good. And there's also a stretch between White's Ferry, but, um, my, my spot down here is really from the Monocacy entrance here all the way down to right about this first Island is a stretch that I've had a lot of success in the past. Um, and again, just depending on the wind and stuff, but, and even the Monocacy is good too, but I don't know if the Monocacy would have been like, I saw people catching them out of the Monocacy this past week, but I don't know if it would have been any good. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. And the other thing too, is like the, the Potomac river is bigger. And I think, I think the person that won it was like way down here a little bit more near, uh, Loudoun County and red rocks. And then this again is, is a really good stretch of river too. This is one though. I would probably, pro this is a stretch right here that I'd probably fish with a jet boat, something like that. But down here by goose Creek is also another really good entrance. You can fish the main stem of the river, or you can go up into goose Creek where I've had a lot of success. And maybe what we'll do is we'll do some video shoots actually on the upper Potomac. Um, I think me and, uh, Scott's fishing and eats. I think, uh, we're going to actually rent a guide service and just go out there and just fish a lot more out of a jet boat and just try to get a good, a good feel for the upper Potomac. Also it'd be nice to check on some spots. Cause I used to have an aluminum boat back when I was a kid and we would run this stuff. Now that I have a, a big ass fiberglass, I don't get to do that anymore. Um, but no, the upper Potomac is, is really cool. I think it's because there's not a lot of places to lock into it and you actually get in there, but no, it, it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, any other questions, guys, please let me know. Yeah, this has like been one fun live stream talking about all things Creek river and Creek and river fishing for smallmouth. But then otherwise, yeah. Thank you guys so much for, uh, Oh, here we go. We got Christopher Sherwood. I have a 15 foot jet boat. Let's go fishing. Christopher. I will, I will absolutely hit you up on that. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, you know, I'm here up in Williamsport, uh, Maryland, so I get to fish around the Upper Potomac and the Conica Jig, which is a lot of fun. But yeah, guys, if you have any questions, if I didn't get your question answered, I apologize. Please email me um, at um, email me at aaronsbassing at gmail.com. If you'd like to be on the show, please reach out to me too. I apologize if I haven't gotten to you, if you're a guest that would like to be on the show, but please reach out to me and I'd love to get you on the show just to be able to share knowledge and information about our, our surrounding area. And if you haven't had a chance, please like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm trying to get to a thousand subs. We're at, we're over 950. We're less than 50 away here. I want to try to grow this so we can have more and more guests on. The bigger the channel is, the more guests want to come on the show. It just gives us a little bit more clout so I can get bigger names on the show. We had Greg Odenkirk, part of uh, Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. I want to continue to get guests like that on the show to come talk about the things that we want to talk about how to make our fisheries better, how to fish better, and how to make sure that there are fish around for the next generation to come. Again, like and subscribe. Please let me know if there's things that you want me to do to make this channel better, and I'll see you next time. You're Bye. To Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.